Hello, everyone. This is Jamie McCarthy, Marketing Manager from LabConnect. Thank you all for attending today's webinar, Local Lab Resorts During an Ongoing Study, Why Local Lab Normalization is Important, brought to you in partnership with Marcus Evans. Before we begin, I would like to review the webinar interface. At the bottom of your screen are several application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can also expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions, please ask them through the Q&A widget. We'll answer as many as possible during the webinar, but if a more detailed answer is needed, or we run out of time, we'll follow up via an email after the webinar. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available on the resource list. You can download any resources or bookmarks and links you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joining us today is Dr. Anthony T. Everhart, MD, who serves as Medical Director here at LabConnect. Dr. Everhart is an innovator, educator, and leader in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries with over 22 years of experience in the practice of medicine and over 11 years of experience in clinical development. He is here to share his expertise with us today. Thank you, Dr. Everhart. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Just a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm a physician by training and board certified in internal medicine. I practiced medicine as a hospitalist before entering industry as a medical monitor over 12 years ago. I spent my early career working for CROs in medical affairs, but approximately five years ago, I became interested in visual analytics as a tool for improved efficiency in medical data review. So I transitioned to medical informatics and developed medical data review methodologies using visual analytics for children and covants. I ultimately left the CRO world to consult independently in the areas of medical monitoring, medical data review, and physician acceptance of technology. And today I serve as the medical director for LabConnect, which specializes in central laboratory services as well as sample tracking, processing, and storage for logistically and analytically complex studies. Today, I'm going to begin by talking about some of the challenges we encounter when conducting studies utilizing local laboratories. As a medical monitor, I oversaw the safety monitoring for numerous trials, particularly in early phase oncology that relied solely on local laboratories for collection of safety labs. This model, which provides quick results to the local principal investigator, can produce some challenging downstream effects. Next, I will propose some solutions to these challenges. Lastly, I will discuss the process of laboratory data normalization and how in-flight normalized data can be generated and analyzed during an ongoing study. There are two primary challenges when working with local labs, data entry and data variability. With data entry, we can see both extended delays as well as data errors. When medical monitoring for trials, I have found it to be not uncommon for days or even weeks worth of local lab reports to accumulate at a site before the data is ever entered into the EDC or database. And when it is entered, there are usually a number of decimal place errors, incorrect units, or incorrect reference ranges. In this age of risk-based monitoring, the entry of this data may or may not be source data verified by ICRA. This leads to the errors being discovered later by a data manager or medical monitor, requiring rounds of queries for correction and resolution. Even after the data has been correctly entered into the database, we face the challenge of data variability. 
The results are often reported in different units across participating sites and laboratories, particularly for global studies, and each lab has its own unique set of reference ranges. All of this leads to a few major downstream effects, delayed monitoring and delayed decision making. Medical monitors and sponsors can be delayed in identifying outliers, patterns, and trends in the data if it is not entered in a timely manner. Also, data entry errors can result in excess noise in the data, making it difficult to identify true safety signals. The true safety picture cannot be seen clearly until the query process has been completed. This in turn can lead to delayed decision making. As a medical monitor, I was often tasked with monitoring laboratory abnormalities to make sure that sites adhered to protocol-defined dose modifications or toxicity management. When using local labs, however, a protocol-defined event may have occurred days or weeks before I would ever see the abnormal result, making it difficult or impossible for me to intervene or provide guidance to the site. This could jeopardize a patient's safety, the integrity of the trial, or both. So what are some possible solutions? How can we increase the speed of data entry? And how can we decrease data entry errors? One possible solution is to centralize local lab report collection. Streamlining the site's ability to get the data into the database is extremely important. Another possible solution is to use double data entry once these local lab reports are collected eliminating data entry errors and significantly reducing the number of queries issued to clean laboratory data. And how can we decrease data variability? To account for local labs reporting results in varying units, the data can be standardized to SI units. And finally, the laboratory data can be normalized against a single set of reference ranges which eliminates the variability in the data introduced by the multiple reference ranges used by the local labs. More on normalization in a moment. At LabConnect, local lab reports are sent by investigative sites to a centralized collection point using eFax or file upload. Language translation is performed for non-English lab reports if required, but if possible, we request that labs be reported in English. Queries are issued and resolved for clarification of data issues, such as duplicate reports, retests, unscheduled tests, etc. The lab results are then double data entered into a lab database, and after adjudication, clean lab data is pushed to the data warehouse. This process provides the ability to produce clean lab data sets in a more timely manner with less burden on the site. It is easier for a coordinator to fax the day's lab reports to a central location than it is to carve out the time necessary to manually enter all of the results into the EDC. We also use our double data entry tool for tracking and metrics. Incorporation of the visit schedule into the methodology allows for the production of tracking reports and can alert the team to missing expected reports. This information can be shared with the CRO or sponsor for follow-up. Also, site performance metrics can be tracked and reported, identifying those sites that consistently take an unreasonable amount of time to fax or upload lab reports once received. We recommend that sponsors set an expected average turnaround time for report submission and then hold sites accountable for their performance. We also track internal metrics for the double data entry process to identify workflow bottlenecks and to support forecasting and resourcing. Once the data is entered and cleaned, it is standardized to SI units, solving the problem of varying units across sites. Once standardized, the data is then normalized. But what is normalization? First, a little background. ICH E9 recommends two analyses for safety laboratory data. One is a qualitative analysis of individual measurements compared to reference ranges. In other words, this is an analysis of high and low results for individual patients. The second is a quantitative analysis with a comparison of means between treatments, groups, or even other studies within the same program. However, calculation of means requires commensurable measurements. And multiple local laboratories using different methods and reporting different reference ranges provide results that are not directly comparable. 
Normalization is a process which transforms the data from different laboratories into a set of values which are directly comparable. So what is required to perform data normalization? First, you need a data set using a single set of units. This is the purpose of the standardization step. Then, you need standardized reference ranges from either a selected laboratory or a theoretical convention. The reference ranges from one of the participating local labs could be chosen to normalize the data against. Alternatively, a set of reference ranges from a non-participating reference laboratory could be chosen for the standardized reference ranges. Once an appropriate set of standardized reference ranges is chosen, then the appropriate statistical model for normalization is applied. Building on the work of Schwang Stein and Sogliero Gilbert, Carvinen provides an excellent statistical basis for laboratory normalization. Specifically, two mathematical formulas, the location scale model and the scale model. In the location scale model, you will note that both the lower and upper limits of normal are used in the equation, with UX and LX representing the upper and lower limits from the local lab, and US and LS representing the upper and lower limits from the reference lab. However, in the scale model, only the upper limits of normal are used from the local and reference labs. The lower limit of normal is not considered in this model. The location scale model, which uses both the upper and lower limits of normal from the local laboratory and reference laboratory, is best applied to a data set that is normally distributed. This hematocrit graph is a good example of a normally distributed set of results, and the location scale model would be the most appropriate model to use for this particular lab assessment. Application of this model to an asymmetrically non-normally distributed data set can result in a negative normalized result. As a negative lab result is not possible, this would indicate that the scale model would be the more appropriate statistical model for normalization. The scale model is a better model for asymmetrically non-normally distributed data. This total bilirubin graph is an excellent example of an asymmetrically non-normally distributed set of lab values. Use of the location scale model would likely result in the occurrence of some negative normalized results. Therefore, the scale model would be the more appropriate statistical model to use for this lab assessment. Also, some laboratory assessments do not have a lower limit of normal, only an upper limit of normal. In such cases, the scale model can be used since it does not require the lower limit of normal in its equation. Let's look at an example. Here we have a set of testosterone lab results. As you can see, these data are asymmetrically or non-normally distributed. When the location scale model is applied, the resulting normalized result is negative. As there is no such thing as a negative lab result, this suggests that the inappropriate model has been applied. When the scale model is used, however, the resulting value is positive. The scale model should be used to normalize this testosterone data set. Not all data can or should be normalized. Let's look at a few exceptions. As normalization is a mathematical process, purely qualitative data cannot be normalized and doesn't need to be. Similarly, semi-qualitative data cannot be normalized, an example being the result of one plus protein on a urinalysis. Also, some laboratory assessments, although quantitative, are reported without a corresponding reference range. For example, many labs do not provide reference ranges for complete blood count differentials reported as a percentage. We have seen many local labs provide reference ranges for the absolute count, but not provide a reference range for the percentage. One we are still investigating is the normalization of results reported above or below the limit of detection. For example, a direct bilirubin reported as less than 0.2 milligrams per deciliter. We can normalize the value of 0.2, but the normalized value may or may not be the true limit of detection for the reference laboratory. 
The options here are to either normalize with full understanding of this limitation or not to normalize values above or below the limit of detection. Once the appropriate statistical model is applied to each lab assessment, a normalized data set is produced. In this example, an albumin of four grams per deciliter was first standardized to SI units, 40 grams per liter. Then, using the local lab reference ranges and the standard reference ranges, the local lab result of 40 grams per liter was normalized to the standardized result 35.23 grams per liter. Once a normalized data set has been produced, the last step is to report the data. Pre- and post-normalized data sets can be exported in a variety of file formats for the sponsor's or CRO's consumption. Also, using visual analytics, the effects of normalization on the data set can be evaluated. At LabConnect, we have been exploring various ways to visually analyze the effects of normalization on the data set. In this example, each column represents a participating local laboratory. The names of the laboratories have been blurred out by the gray bar marked laboratories, and we are assessing the effect of normalization on alanine amino transferase results. Within each column, there are plots for the local lab reference ranges, indicated by the gray arrows, and the local lab results found within the gray box. The corresponding reference ranges from the reference lab used in the normalization process are indicated by the red arrows. And you can see the shift that has occurred in the normalized values found within the red box. Although the normalized values are higher, their distribution relative to the standardized reference range appears similar. Here is a similar analysis using a box plot. Each local laboratory is represented across the x-axis. The names of the laboratories have been blurred out by the gray bar marked laboratories. Again, this is an analysis of alanine aminotransferase. As you can see, the overall pre- and post-normalization data distributions appear similar. However, the normalized data is now distributed within a slightly broader range. The pre-normalized values on the left are distributed between approximately 5 and 100, while the normalized values on the right are distributed between 15 and 105. Now, many will ask whether this has an impact on a normalized result relative to normal or abnormal. Normalizing should not, for lack of a better term, drag a pre-normalized result that was within the normal range into a post-normalized abnormal range. In other words, a normal result should not become abnormal and vice versa. However, there could be a slight impact on the normalized result relative to the upper or lower limit. In this table, at cycle one, day one, the local lab result for alanine aminotransferase has been normalized from a value of 17 to 26.6. Similarly, the local lab result for albumin has been normalized from 44 to 40.4. We have then calculated the ratios of the local lab result to the local lab upper limit and the normalized result to the reference lab upper limit. Ideally, these numbers should be identical. As you can see, for albumin, the ratios are the same across all subsequent assessments. However, when we look at the ratios for alanine aminotransferase, the ratios vary by one-tenth at cycle one, day one. And this mild variance persists across visits. This brings into play an interesting possibility. It is possible that a pre-normalized value that was 2.9 times the upper limit of normal could normalize to a post-normalized value of three times the upper limit of normal. Depending on the protocol, this shift could theoretically have an impact on safety monitoring or reporting. While this analysis could identify those very few occurrences, this is an example of how the availability of normalized data during an ongoing study 
may produce some scenarios not previously encountered. Appropriate decisions on how to handle these phenomena during the study will need to be addressed prior to study start. As normalized data is used for internal analysis and not available to investigators, it is my recommendation that all clinical and protocol decisions be based on the local pre-normalized data. We continue to experiment with additional visualizations to analyze the effects of normalization. This last visualization is what we are calling our 45 degree plot. The pre-normalized result is charted on the x-axis and the normalized result is charted on the y-axis. Each color represents the results for a single local laboratory. The names of the laboratories have been blurred out by the gray bar marked laboratories. And again, this is an analysis of alanine aminotransferase. The slope of the line generated for each laboratory gives an idea of the amount of change between the original value and the normalized value. So, from start to finish, the process looks like this. Receipt of local laboratory reports from the investigative sites, followed by double data entry and query issue and resolution. Then the data is standardized and normalized. Finally, the normalized data set is prepared for export and analysis. This process increases the data entry speed, decreases data entry errors, and produces a data set which allows for comparison of results across multiple local laboratories. And this data can be more readily available in flight during an ongoing study, allowing for more timely analysis and decision making. Thanks so much for your time today. I would be happy to entertain any questions. Well, thank you, Todd. Thank you for your time. Um, so let's let's take a few questions in the time left. If we run out of time, we'll do make sure to follow up with you in a separate email after the webinar is done. Um, so Todd, the first question that I have here for you, um, is there some sort of cover sheet required? Does the site have to redact the lab report? No, good question, yes. Um, we do uh, at Lab Connect provide a study specific cover sheet um, uh, and it'll have all of the information on the cover sheet that's required uh, for the site to enter, um, the demographics of the patient, obviously the subject ID, and then um, we will have a, a visit schedule on that cover sheet as well so they can, they can select that this is a, uh, a lab for a particular uh, visit that corresponds with the study. And then we do ask that on the actual lab report itself that they send along with that cover sheet that they redact uh, the patient information that we would not normally send uh, electronically. Thank you. And does this process take into account the differences in analyzers processes between labs? No, it actually doesn't. That's, that's not uh, the purpose of normalization. That would be more what we would call harmonization, where you're trying to account for differences in analyzer equipment or reagents or something like that from lab to lab to lab. Um, this is just a statistical model to bring disparate lab data into a single uh, normalized data set against a standardized reference range or a chosen reference range. So it's more of a mathematical process than it is an analytical process. Um, to harmonize labs, you would have to provide standardized samples and have all of the labs run their standardized samples and then um, uh, do some work to harmonize those values. So that's not the purpose of normalization. Uh, we see the purpose of normalization as being able to provide a data set during the study that can be used to monitor safety trends across sites or treatment groups or other, or other cohorts of patients um, that you would not necessarily be able to do when you have lab results coming from multiple laboratories using different reference ranges. Thank you. And how long does it normally take from faxing of results to normalization? Um, the, uh, currently what we've been doing is we can get the lab data and the raw lab data available in the database within um, three days. Um, 
typically we've actually been able to do that normally within 24 hours, but we're, we're giving ourselves a metric to meet of three days. Um, the sites, again, I talked earlier about um, the need to have some metrics on site performance as well, because we still run into those sites that even though we've tried to make it as easy as possible, um, they still tend to batch their faxing of lab reports, and so we get large, large quantities all at the same time, which can slow things down a little bit. But if the sites would just fax things in daily, then we can turn that around fairly quickly. We've been uh, doing this for a little while now. We've been producing normalized data sets monthly, but we're looking at being able to actually provide normalized data sets even more quickly, um, even possibly on a daily basis. Um, with some uh, improvements in our uh, normalization engine. We're currently doing the normalization outside of our database entry tool. We'd like to move the normalization process actually into the double data entry tool so that when it's pushed to the warehouse, it would be automatically normalized at that point, which would speed things up considerably. Um, but right now we can produce normalized data sets fairly quickly. Um, uh, we've been doing it monthly. We could easily probably do that weekly right now, but we'd like to see it almost become real time once the data hits the warehouse and is clean and been adjudicated, that it would be normalized at that point. Thank you, Todd. Um, why are many of the vis visualizations displayed by lab instead of by site? Uh, good question. The, what, what we found um, when we started doing this is, uh, you know, we have some large uh, cities uh, where the um, patients at a single site may actually go to different labs, and they may choose different labs to go to, and the labs will come in, the laboratory results will come in from multiple labs for the same site. And we've also found that um, when you have multiple sites in the same city, the patients from different sites may use the same lab. So we can have a crossover of labs and sites and sites and labs. So we've been looking at the effect of normalization on a lab level. We can certainly develop visualizations on a site level as well. Um, but you can get a little noise if the site is using multiple labs or the patients are, are going to different labs uh, within that cohort. So um, we've, we've been looking at the, the normalization on a, on a lab level uh, rather than a site level in our initial visualizations. Thank you. Are the local lab reports available for review by the sponsor and CRAs? They can be made available. Um, it's just a matter of uh, how we want to get that data pushed out to the sponsor. Uh, it can be something as simple as data transfers, like the old days, or we can actually grant access to visualize the data and see the data results in a web portal. And then it, uh, the people that can see that, the individuals that are given permission to see that, can vary depending on the sponsor's wishes. Um, does the FDA generally accept normalized values that are outside of the limit of detection of four parameters? Because this adds a level of complexity in normalizing. I agree. And um, we've also had the question about, you know, can, can this data be used for submission? Uh, we're providing this service mainly so that you can have in-flight data that allows you to have commensurable results across sites or labs or groups or cohorts um, so that you can monitor safety trends uh, more easily and, and, and look for changes in the data across the data set more easily when you're dealing with so many local labs. Uh, it doesn't necessarily replace the need for a central lab. If your endpoint was dependent upon a lab, perhaps we would like to decrease the noise by using a central lab where we do account for changes in analyzer type or reagents and equipment and things like that or processes. Um, but can, can this data be used for submission? I would encourage anybody that's using normalized data for submission or, or something along those lines to work directly with their statistician. I mean, we've been normalizing data for a long time now. It's just typically been done at the end of the study by the stats team. But at that point, it's too late to have had the benefit of using that data for safety monitoring and, and other monitoring during the course of the study. So. Um, yeah, when you're looking at data that's outside of the uh, the limit of detection, that's where we've kind of we've kind of given pause. I think you can normalize that data, but when it's normalized to that new value, that new value may or may not actually be the limit of detection had you run that same sample at the reference lab. So we might have introduced a little bit of noise with that, and that's one we're still working with 
um, the appropriate way to handle the, the lab values outside of the limit of detection. Thank you. Well, we do have time for a few more questions, so please keep them coming in. Um, if several labs use the same local lab different than the local lab for other sites, is there some sort of weighting needed for normalization of data? No, not necessarily. No, the, the normalization, I was rereading the question there. So the normalization is, is built into the calculation. There's no other weighting that's required. All we need is a standard reference range. And again, you can choose that as one of the participating sites, and you're going to use the reference range from that participating site and all values will be normalized to that, those reference ranges, or you could use a theoretical convention, so a, a non-participating uh, reference labs set of reference ranges could be used, and you could normalize to that, but there's no additional weighting required. Thank you. And who enters the data into the EDC, the site or Lab Connect? Well, in this instance, uh, what we've been using is we are entering it into a lab database and providing that lab data back to the sponsor for, for, for their use. And so we're actually not entering it into the database, uh, the EDC. Uh, lab Connect is not entering it into the EDC, nor is the site. It's being entered into a separate lab database, and then that database is being incorporated with the additional clinical data that's being collected. Thank you, Todd. And um, um, is this normalized data submission ready, and does this replace the need for central lab? No, we kind of, we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. I don't think it, it completely um, replaces the need for central labs for um, possibly an endpoint-related uh, laboratory value or something like that. Um, there's probably there's certainly still a place for having um, those labs performed at a, a single laboratory or as few laboratories as possible where there is some consistency in the analyzer type through agents used, et cetera. And again, if you're going to use any of this data for submission, we would recommend that you um, work closely with your statistician. We, we're providing this more as a tool for um, safety monitoring during an ongoing study. Um, and uh, But I would, I would certainly want to make sure at the outset of the study that um, you discussed it clearly with your uh, statistician how this data could or should be used. Thank you. And can the normalization be done directly from sponsor EDC? It is possible. Um, so if you still want to have the sites enter the data uh, into the EDC, it would be possible for LabConnect to pull the data from the EDC and then normalize that data. Um, so there's kind of two steps in that process, right? And there's the, the local receipt and data entry process, and then there's the normalization process. And those two could be done separately, right? So we could, we could actually do all of the receipt and data entry and never normalize if you didn't require normalized results. And then that would just decrease your delays in data entry and decrease um, the amount of um, errors in data entry that we typically see when when you have single entry um, processes at individual sites. So we could provide that service, um, but not necessarily have to normalize the data. We could just provide the raw data back, or we could we could actually pull raw data from another source and then perform the normalization as well, and then provide the normalized data back. Great, thank you. And maybe one final question before we wrap up. Um, uh, what lead time is required for startup? You know, it's actually not too much lead time at all. What we do want to spend some time on up front is um, taking the visit schedule and coming up with a, a bespoke cover sheet so it makes it as easy as possible for the site to enter in the patient demographics, check which visit this lab is associated with, so that we decrease the amount of time the site has to spend on any type of cover sheet so that they can quickly fill out the cover sheet, uh, join it with the uh, the lab report, and get it faxed into us. So we, we do have some lead time on setting up uh, that process, and then we internally need to set up our uh, our lab database and then, um, and then how we're going to export that data at the end. Um, so I don't want to get in trouble. I'm the physician, not the data management team, but it would only take a matter of um, 
uh, probably four weeks to uh, to get something set up if we can uh, if we can get a good visit schedule if we've got a good protocol with a finalized visit schedule then it wouldn't take long at all to uh, to put the pieces in place where we could begin uh, receiving um, the uh, lab reports entering that data and then um, exporting it in uh, raw and, and normalized data sets interesting thank you todd uh well that is all the time we have for questions today thanks again for sending those in um and of course a reminder to look out for an email within the next two hours um, with access to the on-demand version of this webinar and we would also like your feedback so if you could take a minute to answer our very brief survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the session that would be very much appreciated. On behalf of Lab Connect and Market Sevens webinars, we would like to thank you for joining us, and we do hope that you'll be listening in at our next webinar. Thank you.